Welcome everyone um, to, I think what will be a story about two families. Um, we haven't over rehearsed, which is good. Uh, Marcella and I, um, again, Christoph Dressler and Marcella at the School of Business. She will explain herself uh, and what she does for the School of Business in a minute. Um, so we, uh, we, we, we go back for a few years. We met um, and, at a humanities event. So shout outs to the College of Humanities. Um, and we were talking and realizing that we have more in common than uh, we would have ever dreamt. Um, and so we will share that story today with you. Um, it's kind of a follow-up on a, on a program that I, or on a presentation that I did on East Germany a few weeks back. And Marcella was in the audience room and she said, man, we need to talk. And so I figured let's talk with people in the room. Um, if you are, and um, welcome, if you are alumni, yay, shout out to the Alumni Association. If you're alumni of the School of Business, even better, go Utes. Um, and um, thank you for being here, Marcella, today. Um, this will be more of a conversation. So this is a new one for me. Um, I will not necessarily always leave the room, but when Marcella presents, I, I might turn my camera off just to uh, save you the distraction of my, of my globe. Um, as you run your cursor over the screen, you'll see some question and answer and a chat uh, function in your screen, everybody out there. Please post your question if you want to. We would love to get to them. Um, I think we are first gonna just talk. Um, see where this leads us. Our memories, we'll dig, we'll dig out uh, some stories. Um, I roughly know what Marcella is gonna say. She roughly knows my life, but maybe we all gonna learn even more today about our past in, <coughs> in and around East Germany. And um, yeah, uh, enjoy and uh, post your questions and we'll, we'll get to them. Marcella, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks, Christoph. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm really happy. <laughs> That's the end of democracy as we know it. Hopefully that's not fortuitous of things to come. Is that the European flag? Just, just was the uh, European flag? Was the Euro the European flag? Oh no, you're just, just yeah, there we tumble go. down. Was that was hopefully that's not an omen. No, no, it's not. <laughs> so. Yeah, Christoph and I met a few years ago at the College of Humanities. Um, I knew he was German, not from his accent, but because he was wearing socks with sandals, and so I knew then. That <laughs> so, and I'll be honest, I actually asked him for a job. I was, I was fascinated and still am by Go Learn, and I asked him for a job. He wasn't hiring at the time, and briefly since then, I have a wonderful career working at the Eccles School of Business here at the U, and I'm a career coach um, for the Eccles School of Business at Business Career Services. As a career coach, um, among many of my responsibilities, I work with students on recognizing the cultural competencies that are gained from study abroad. And I help them to articulate that and those skills on resumes and during interviews. Also, one thing I'm proud of here at um, in my job is I'm an active member of the faculty learning community of Global Learning Initiatives. So I try to always embed anything intercultural about the work that I do. Christoph, would you like me to kind of start with my story here? How would yes. you like? Yeah, okay. I, I think that's what we're going to do. Um, we'll have your family present on your family, present on your background regarding East Germany and, and beyond for you. And uh, I will chime in in just a few minutes when, when you feel like, and we will, we will banter around a little bit about growing up in East Germany, um, me as literally having been there all the way until the wall coming down and you and your mom on the other side of the fence. But there we go, please tell us. Yeah, and so I think we're gonna also keep our Q&A until the end here um, because otherwise, I'll be speaking forever probably. So, so like Christoph says, to give you a very, very brief overview, and I'm gonna expand on this a little bit. My mother is an immigrant from East Germany and that was something that actually she never planned. And so as a result, I traveled to East Germany quite a bit while I was growing up because her family could not travel to the US. But to, because this is a tale of two East German families, I am going to tell my story. I have to back up and actually tell my mom's story. So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of that by sharing my screen here. Just a moment to get this going. All right. And this. And sorry, all sorts of things to move on Zoom. All right. <clears throat> so, so my mother was born in Kremen, Germany in 1932. Kremen is a small village of now about 7,000 people that's 36 kilometers northeast of Berlin. 
So she was born there. This is Kremen before World War II. This is during the Cold War. As you can see, you can recognize the very Eastern Bloc housing there. And then this is Kremen mostly today. It's this great little hamlet. Um, it's now more of a suburb of Berlin. She actually, her family, they lived in a very small community called Amalienfelde. There are three roads in Amalienfelde, Mittelweg, Nordweg, and, Sw and Sudweg, middle, north, and south. And her family lives in, north, in Nordweg. The property on which, honestly, my family and my cousins still live was bought, was purchased for my grandfather by his father in 1927. Um, my grandfather is a, was a gardener and it was purchased to be a gardening community. So my mother was born there in 1932. She turned seven, five days before World War II broke out. She was the eldest of four siblings and they were each four years apart. So this is my mother here. So here she is, Gisela Henning was her birth name. Um, Gisela, she's the oldest of Anna Marie Ziegrid, the woman, her and her brother Wolf was her, was her favorite here. So um, World War I happened, as we know, she has lots of stories about that. And then as it ended, she had an opportunity still somehow to go to school in West Berlin. In the late 40s and early 50s, there was still some mobility between East and West Berlin, because as you know, the wall wasn't put up yet. The wall wasn't erected until 1961. If you're wondering, actually, I should back up here and say where exactly this area is. If you've ever been to Sanssouci in Potsdam, Sanssouci is King Friedrich's summer palace. This is a very, very famous palace now in, in East Germany. In the former East Germany, I was also able to travel there a lot while I was growing up. Here's my mother circled in red visiting this palace in 19, um, as a 14 year old. So this kind of gives you an area. If you've been to Potsdam or Wannenberg, there are about, they're all, all within about 30 minutes of each other. So um, let me go back here, oops. So my mother was able to go to an art school in West Berlin when she was around 15, 16 years old. So this was in the late forties and she lived with a great aunt who was living in West Berlin. Things didn't go well, the art school closed and she needed to work. So she actually got a job as an au pair working as a nanny in Sweden for a professor's family. This would have been around 1952. Because she was living with her aunt in West Berlin at this time, she applied for a passport and she was able to obtain a West German passport. This was actually news to me. I didn't realize this until I started asking her questions for this presentation because I always wondered how she was able to travel. So she, as the eldest of four, was the only one in her family who had a passport and she was able to have a West German passport. And this is really key circumstance number one in how she ended up in the United States. So she moves to Sweden for two years, works as no pair for, her, um, for a Professor's family, she lives there with her best friend Renata. They have a great time. They come back at what well, their two year stint ends in 1954. While she's living in Sweden, her father is writing her letters and says, well, it's a great thing you like living in Sweden because you no longer have a home to come back to. He was basically telling her, you can't come back here to the East. Things were changing. You need to do something else. And so after her stint in Sweden ends, she moves with her friend Renata to Mannheim and my mother gets a job teaching arts and crafts. She is, I think, a 22 year old here. She's teaching arts and crafts to American GIs. She actually got the job through the unemployment office in Mannheim um, and this was her job. She was teaching leather work and pottery to American GIs in, the, in, in Mannheim. While she's living in Mannheim, she meets someone named George, who's an American serviceman. And George likes to do photography and he uses my mother as his muse. He's the one who's taking the picture here. So she's her, his muse for, I don't know, six months to a year or so. And then his tour ends and he returns home to California and the two of them proceed to be pen pals. At the end in 1957, she has saved up enough money, she and Renata, that they are able to travel on the SS Mazdam to the United States. Renata actually has another job as an au pair and my mom's hoping to get a job as an au pair as well. So they travel on the SS Mazdam. Here's actually a picture of them. I believe this is July 4th, they're having a fancy dress party. They arrive in port in New York, very excited. She's a 24 year old young woman at this point. And as they're disembarking in New York, she actually sees her pen pal, George, waiting for her with a, with a bouquet of flowers to surprise her. So this was unexpected. And with me in my hindsight, I think, well, that's kind of creepy that this man that you were only writing to has driven out from California to surprise you when you're literally, literally when your ship comes into New York. So, but my mother at the time, at that moment in time, did not think that was very creepy. And she was very excited. She was 24 years old. She just arrived in the United States. Here's someone she's been writing to who's there to meet her. It's all very exciting. 
Renata goes off with her family and my mother goes off with George. But things changed very quickly. And by the end of that week, what she didn't know is that George had actually arranged to marry her on national television on a show called Bride and Groom. And five days later, sure enough, they were in NBC studios and George married her on this show called Bride and Groom. So she didn't know what to do. She wasn't happy. She really didn't know him very well. She barely spoke the language. She did not have the resources to get a divorce. She could not call home and she knew nobody. So what did she do? She stayed married. She and George traveled across country where he's lived. He finished college on the GI Bill. He accepted a job offer teaching high school science in Alaska. They moved to Alaska in 1962. Two years later, he left her almost as quickly as he had married as he had married her. Two years after that, she meets a man named Alan Kirschbaum. Now I know I'm skimming a lot here in the interest of time, but this really this is key circumstance number three. She meets a man named Alan Kirschbaum, and two years after that, they marry and they have two children, myself and my brother Travis. And I should also say that in 1961 is when she was able to obtain her citizenship in the, um, after being married to George. So between the years of 1968 and 1989, really just two months before the fall of the wall, as a result, I was able to visit German, East Germany about 10 times, actually. This is my first trip back in 1968. I should show these pictures purposefully because the pictures that are color are photos that my mother took with her camera with color film. And the photo that's black and white is a photo that her mother took with black and white film because up until the mid seventies, black and white film was not available in East Germany. So that kind of brings us to where we are here today. I'll pause for a moment, but that's a brief overview of really how my mother came to the United States. She's, as the eldest of four, she was the only member of her family who ever left. The rest of them all lived and still remain living on this piece of property in East Germany. I'll take a break here before I move on and Christoph can fill in some details about his family. Well, um, that was fascinating, especially like, you know, I, I getting a, a passport in the 50s as an East German who just happens to be in the in the good circumstance of having an aunt in West Berlin. As you all know out there, um, that's kind of part of why the wall actually was built by Walter Ulbricht in 8061. We had a major brain drain. Um, everybody who could and who was able and had the means would leave um, East Germany, or, you know, especially uh, those with a university degree or a solid um, uh, trade or, or um, education in, let's say, as a doctor, uh, professors, et cetera, they would leave. Uh, my family was in a little bit of a different circumstance. So my, my father's side, um, they're coming, they're from Thuringia, from a town called Jena. And his... Um, uh, my father's grandmother, so my great grandmother, left also in the 50s. Um, she and um, um, cousins of the family went down to Lake Constance. So while um, that was the reality for some, here's the story about my mom's side of the family. And again, the reason why I don't have pictures is twofold. One is we have a pandemic and I can't go home because everybody in my family is still at home in my village. Sachsenbrunn in Thuringen, Thuringia. Um, so I couldn't just grab some and digitize them and, and make them part of my presentation. The other one is, Marcella just alluded to this, photography was one of the things that would cost you a little bit of money and you had to have connections. And while my grandpa was an avid photographer um, for East German standards, there isn't really a lot of photography material that is existence and existing on my family. So everything that we have is heirloom and is in a special uh, folder and photography was quite rare. So that's one reason, but I, I'll just tell you the story anyway um, and without visuals. So my mom's side of the family, they lived in a town called Mühlhausen in Thuringen, Thuringia. And her um, family had a business. They had a, a little car repairs business, which was doing really well until 1972, until finally the communists took that away from the family. Um, Grandpa Erich would have never left uh, the city that he grew up in. Um, he would have never left the circumstances in, in which he was with his business. Um, and I think that's true for many East Germans, including most parts of my family, when in the 50s there was still the chance to leave. 
there was yet not, you know, the political situation was not as dire as it would be as detrimental to the family to just pick up and move to the West. So many East Germans didn't do it when they had the chance. But of course, Walter Ulbricht, who famously claimed that nobody plans to raise a wall, uh, did so in a, in a heartbeat in 1961 in August. So we all remember that. Um, that's sort of like the background in terms of split of my family. We have my great grandmother over in Con Lake, at Lake Constance. And we will talk about what happens now in terms of visiting. Um, I never really met her until really the wall came down. So she never really came back to visit us. But every now and then we would get a package uh, via my grandparents and then it was distributed to the family. And these packages were these uh, vest pocket. It was like a, um, a, 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 a kind of like a lifeline to the West. And hopefully it was for me as a child um, I grew up in the late 70s, early 80s as a, as a child in, in East Germany. Hopefully it was chocolate or coffee or something nice. But for most parts, it was used clothes, which was great too. You know, your blue jeans from, 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 the, from the West that, you know, still was something. Um, yeah. And for the longest time, I ran around with a sweater that had uh, um, John Wayne on it, <laughs> smoking guns. That was my favorite sweater in, 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 in my childhood. Yeah, Marcella, what, um, I know that you and your mom came back. So tell us a little bit how that was when you crossed the border. Yeah, you know, well, we came back many times. And I think just to piggyback on what you were saying, my, because my family had property, they were not educated. No one in my family had ever gone to college. They, were, they just made it very clear they weren't leaving. That was, never, that was never an option for them to leave. And so because my mother was the oldest, that really presented an opportunity for her. She always liked art, and so she wanted to attend a school in West Berlin, the Lettre School, I think Letter School it was called, and she did for two years until they had to close, they couldn't sustain themselves. So yeah, I grew up going back there um, and it's like, it's, you know, from a young age, and I think for me, because I always went there from a very young age, I never experienced the culture shock that someone like my father did when he first traveled back in the early 70s. For him, it was just mind-blowing. He'd grown up with this fear of communism and growing up during the Cold War. And so one time he flew into Schoenefeld in East Berlin and he was on a flight with someone he was certain was a KGB officer. And he says, he remembers landing in Schoenefeld and there were no glass doors anywhere. Every single door was a steel door. So for him, I think he never felt 100% comfortable going there. Whereas for me, I was really used to it. I'm gonna share the screen again um, and just see here. Can I get to here? So, Let's see here. Here, here's a great, so here, all the photos that even the professional photos that were sold as, as gifts, if you will, were all in black and white. So here, Berlin, Hauptstadt, der Air. Going back to East Berlin or to East Germany, and a lot of, I was always through East Berlin, it was like stepping into a black and white photo. And I think that Christoph will concur. Everything just, time had stopped. Everything was black and white. Um, so when I think of East Berlin or East Germany, I think of black and white and I think of bureaucracy. And so, so here are some photos that, let's see if I can do this, if I'm doing this right or not. Sorry. Um, these are all taken actually from a, a, a packet of postcards my mother purchased in 1964. Here's a rural clock and what was called the Funkturm. Here at the Funkturm, the television tower, there was actually a restaurant inside there that would rotate. And I remember going there a few times with my grandmother. She would take me there for a very special lunch to eat the restaurant. I think it took an hour for it to rotate around. When I went back to Germany with my son in 2016, um, I wanted to take him up there, but it's now I think 35 euros to go up to the front term. And before it was, it was free short of whatever we spent on lunch, which wasn't very expensive. So here's some great photos of, of East Berlin in the 60s. This is um, Stalin Allee. I'm not even sure where this is, Christoph. Now, do you know where this is, what this is now? Um, this is Karl Marx Allee. They they changed it after after Stalin's fall from grace after his death. So again, this is a postcard my mom purchased in 1964, and here, of course, is the Brandenburg Tour. So what, what a lot of people don't know, I don't, I'm sure that Christoph knows this now, but he didn't know then, is that to visit there as a Westerner, you had to, you had to literally pay money. Our family paid, uh, everyone had to pay, you had to exchange 25 Westmarks or 25 US dollars 
for 25 Ostmarks for every person for every day that you were there. So we were a family of four. So it, we, we would have to exchange $100 per day for every day that we were there. And because we didn't go very often, we'd stay for 10 days to two weeks. So we'd have to save our money to do this. But this was everyone. If you were just a day tourist going for the day, you had to exchange your 25 West Marks for 25 Ost Marks. And then the thing is, the Ost Marks, the East Marks had no exchange value on the Western market, nor were you actually supposed to bring them out with you. So it, it, was, it was a great scheme they had going on. So when we went over, we'd save our money, we'd have our money for the day. And then this was the process of just getting in. I, so because we were in Berlin, we went through Checkpoint Charlie. So we would fly into the airport, we'd take a taxi with all of our luggage filled to, down the block from Checkpoint Charlie. We were, never ever, we were never able to go right up to Checkpoint Charlie. So the taxi would drop us off down the block from Checkpoint Charlie where we'd up our luggage. We would be bringing in used clothes, cartons of Marlboro cigarettes, and toilet paper. If you remember anything from Christoph's first presentation, it was, it was great toilet paper back there. So we'd bring a lot of that with us, a lot of gifts. We'd go through Checkpoint Charlie, which was like a labyrinth, really, and they asked many questions. I, my mom always advised me never to say anything, never to, only to speak when I was spoken to. And the very first question they would always ask us is, how much money are you carrying with you? So we'd have to declare that money. One time, because I was young and I had a little bit of my own money, I remember piping up and starting to say, what about my money? What about my money? And my mother stepped on my foot to get me to stop talking because she didn't want to cause any heavy alarms go off. So we get through Checkpoint Charlie. My aunt and uncle then would be waiting for us at the other side. They, they would be waiting for us sometimes two hours. We'd give them a ballpark of when we flew in and they would just wait for us to literally to emerge through this labyrinth on the other side. After he, they picked us up, then we would go directly to the police station and we'd all four register with the police station and get these stamps and our visas and our passports. And then we would take the passport to the bank. We would show the exact dates of when we were going to be there and we'd exchange our money for the East Marks. And then we'd go finally to the family home and we'd register with the house book. So it was a lot of bureaucracy before we ever got there. Um, again, Checkpoint Charlie was really was a really unique place. I found these images on the internet because I don't recall ever being able to take a picture of Checkpoint Charlie or having the desire to. And now if you've been in East Berlin or, or in former East Berlin, if you, you'll see a little, it's, to me it's like Disneyland, you'll see a, a, a house that says it's Checkpoint Charlie or a building. It's not, not, not only is that not Checkpoint Charlie as it was, it was also, it's not where it was either. So, um, one other thing my mother always warned me about is to never say anything bad about the country while we were in country. And I thought that she was actually just kind of teaching me to be polite, which she was in a sense. But what I learned much later is that she was she knew that the Stasi had eyes and ears everywhere and to never say anything or we could get reported. There is a rumor in our family that my uncle was actually a Stasi informant. He's still alive. But I feel like I shouldn't ask him that because he is 84 years old at this point. There were other checkpoints as well. And there was one in Friedrichstrasse, which I believe was in an U-Bahn station, station. And once in a while, my mom would, and I, she would leave with me for a day to go shopping and then bring gifts back to our family. And so I was six years old, we were going to the Friedrichstrasse uh, checkpoint and I didn't really speak German at the time, And but they wanted to test me to, to make sure that the person that she was leaving with was actually the person on the passport. And so he, the, the agent said something to me in German and she said, um, you have a really nice raincoat and I didn't understand it or say anything. It didn't make any marks. And so that person knew that I was indeed not a German child being smuggled out, but it was actually me, the person on my passport. They were also very specific about no propaganda coming in. And there was an incident where my mother was bringing a record of a Czechoslovakian singer to her, uh, her sister in the, in the East and you could not bring in any records. And they stopped and they interrogated her and they asked her who the record was for and what was the address of the person the record was for. And, and they kept, then they said, well, you can either travel through without the record or you can leave it here overnight and come pick it up tomorrow, which is what she did. And then she came back the next day and the record had of course been opened and then played and but they, were, they gave it to her and they, she was able the next day to bring it through. The irony of that is that the singer of course is the Czech singer, which was, and, and that person was, part of the communist country. And because of where my family lived so close to Berlin, although the, no one was able to bring in any propaganda, there was all sorts of propaganda that was available through the Berlin television stations and the Berlin radio stations. So they had access to all Western radio. And frankly, I'd be over there and I'd be watching advertisements for McDonald's television in West Germany, in East Germany, because they could pick up those TV stations. 
So it was just really interesting, the dichotomy that, that they lived with. Similar to Christoph's photos that he showed previously, um, yeah, I, I remember experiencing the gray toilet paper. We would always bring in the TP and the cigarettes. Um, at the time, my father smoked and the cigarettes in East Germany were no good. Um, and, but more than anything, there was, for me, it was really a sense of family and a sense of community. There was a lot of drinking and smoking that went on, as you can see here, from a very young age. But there was also a lot of cake and a lot of food. And those are the things that I really, those are the things that I really think about when I, when I think about that time in East Germany is really the sense of family. For me, it was all about family and community. So I'll take another, yeah, here we, this is, I mean, this picture here of the, of the Eastern block houses, that's so indicative. I'm sure there's a turbant or two in this picture as well, but this was very typical East Germany at the time, but. I'll stop here and take a break, Christoph, and let you share a few little bit more about your story. Well, uh, the, it, it jogged a lot of my memories, of course. Um, the, the, the cool thing you mentioned about propaganda, a lot of it was also the uh, uh, things in print. So Der Stern, um, just uh, Western um, articles on pretty much everything. Um, if you ever watched The Lives of Others, um, it was kind of also a currency to have, um, there was this youth magazine called Bravo. They always had stickers in it and stories about, you know, you, Wham and Depeche Mode and whatnot. <laughs> so we were, it was kind of like a really barter um, um, currency. Um, anything with propaganda, anything from the West was, was able, because you mentioned how little East German Mark was really worth, First of all, even if you had some, what are you going to buy with it? Um, you get, you know, you get your cheap bread from the grocery stores. You have, you know, if, if you're lucky, you need to hoard a little bit of toilet paper. Um, but, uh, but other than that, you know, um, the West German mark on the gray market worked so much better and the barter system. And you mentioned also something uh, about family. I've got a, just a few slides to show you a few examples of, of these things. Um, you started with um, um, talking about listening to West German radio, and uh, uh, I have a slide here prepared. Um, uh, where is my screen? Oh, I, I apologize. I need to actually start the presentation. There we go. Um, all right. This would work a lot better. Screen three. So the uh, what you see here on on is East Germany right in front of you, and everywhere where you see black, um, the most eastern and southeastern and northeastern part were really the ones that we called uh, Tal der Ahnungslosen, the Valley of the uh, of the uh, of the Clueless, um, because radio towers, radio and TV would not reach them. So towns like Dresden. And the very up northern part of Brandenburg were really kind of like in the dark in terms of that. But the rest of East Germany, if you see all these red little dots, of course, wherever there was a hill, um, the Americans and the uh, and the and the and the Russians as well on our side would put not only up their spy towers, but also in terms of propaganda, would radio their information into the other country. Only that, as to my in information, no West German really wanted to listen to East German. Uh, propaganda or radio. So that was, it was a one-way street and it was, uh, I grew up uh, right down here. This is in the, in the state of Thuringen, Thuringia. And you see how this little thing sticks out here like an appendix into Bavaria. Literally, that's where my home was. And literally, um, we could go either left or right and we would hit the wall. Um, so this is right, the, the town of Coburg is right across the, the, the border here. But you can see how surrounded we were by these big radio towers in the West, um, mostly also Amer American uh, military towers. And um, yeah, we were, we were getting it from all angles. And you could tell back in the day, you remember this, uh, the Americans had the same thing. You had to put your antenna in a certain way to get certain radio in. And you kind of like could tell where the <laughs> antenna was pointing, uh, what the family was tuning into. So that's uh, one thing that uh, as, as memory memory lane. Uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, share was, uh, of course, you know, when we talk about toilet paper, uh, you guys have it posh. Uh, Marcela, do you remember how that 
felt like. <laughs> oh, I should, we, we still refer to it as sandpaper. We had the san, der Sandmann and then we had the sandpaper, you know? Yeah. So. Um, um, yes, exactly. So this was really not high quality stuff, but um, um, you got a little taste of this. If you have a shortage, um, if, if there is a chance that there will be no toilet paper for the next half a year, you will buy a little bit more of it. And that's what the East Germans always did. The other thing that we couldn't buy was is the banana. So you saw how far southwest I used to live in East Germany. They used to be first, the first ones who get the bananas when, you know, a good ship from Cuba would land and we would actually get Südfrüchte from Cuba, including bananas, uh, we, may, we may end up in Berlin, uh, the first ones. So Marcella's family in and around Berlin may have had more of bananas than the folks down south uh, west where I was living. So I remember one banana a year. That's usually what I ended up with. Um, so when the wall came down, uh, everybody went out. Every, every East German spent their first money on, on bananas and fruit. And so West Germany was sold out from all the fruit. Um, again, our, our, our consume, consume was the, the place where you buy stuff, was really limited, really sparse. Uh, I think uh, I presented on this earlier, like we had plenty of food, but sometimes we had just had to make things up um, with the basics that we had. Uh, there was always party, Marcella was talking about this, and this is how they keep you, keep you happy in a communist regime. <laughs> Booze and cigarettes are cheap. Uh, what the Germans were really good at were um, with their children, their, the East Germans. They were really kind and nice to us as, as children. Um, and I think we had, I had a great childhood. If you don't know what you're missing, you don't know what you're missing, right? And you see what you have. And the good thing about growing up in East Germany, although every now and then some of my classmates had a little bit more from the West, but that was basically it. Uh, everything that came from the East, everybody had it. Everybody had access to some sort of shoes, clothing, um, you know, in this case, uh, a, 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 a suitcase for school. Everybody had the same suitcase. Everybody kind of like looked the same. So um, the, the overall, the kids, the kids were, um, did have little to compare other than the, the fact that maybe Andy, my friend Andy, always had stuff from West Germany in terms of uh, bubble gum and, 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 and things like that. Nutella, cannot tell you. I mean, we would lick the Nutella glass clean when, once, it's, once it was done. Um, yeah, and we, you know, we had an um, uneventful but fun childhood. Um, and yes, we, are, we were always aware, especially the older I got, um, in what kind of a... Um, uh, uh, training camp we really are in, in a way, in a way. Um, so there was always sports, there was always organized uh, things in East Germany. Um, there was always the, um, here's a, that's a, um, a social realist uh, uh, um, mural that's in, in Dresden actually. So we were always learning about Walter Ulbricht and, and his stories. We would have see, of course see the architects of communism over here. You got uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, you know, um, you got the uh, the Russian army, the Red Army, as our liberator and as our friends uh, in the East. Uh, you know, the workers, the soldiers, you know, and we have just like the French in the Revolution, we have our German Marianne, which is kind of coincidental because my grandmother's name is Marianne. Um, she's waving the red flag. That's not my grandma, obviously. Um, so I'll stop sharing, we can talk, but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I never saw an American and I wish I would have met Marcella up there uh, in, 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 in Berlin and East Germany. Did people have a lot of questions? I would have, I would have probably, I mean, of course you, maybe your German was at that point limited, but maybe it wasn't, but uh, I probably would have, I would have asked you a thousand questions if I had ever met you as a, as a kid. Um, did you get that? You know, because I was visiting Amalienfelde, which was this very, very small, like three lane little dwarf. Um, not really. They, you know, I, I think I was more curious about them. And when I traveled to actually to Berlin with my Oma once in a while, um, 
I, I, I don't know how much, I mean, I'm sure people could probably tell me about what I was wearing, but I wasn't asked a whole lot. It was more, I think they were very excited to see my mother whenever she visited and meant that she was bringing gifts. And, but no one asked, I don't remember anyone asking me a whole lot. I, it's funny when you talk about music because my cousins, their favorite band was Kiss. And I remember it, like their Kiss posters being on the wall. I don't know how they got Kiss posters, honestly. I don't think they got them from us, but you know, and thinking back about the money, like you say, there was not much to spend the money on. And so we would have exchanged, let's say the equivalence of 1200 East marks, but there was nothing to spend it on. And there was very little that could be exported, you know, and everything was searched through when you, cause you would have to go, you would have to exit through Checkpoint Charlie again also. So, and you couldn't bring out any of the West money. So we would just leave it there with our family. And it, it, food was very inexpensive. There wasn't much to spend anything on. I used to visit Schloss Longsissi in Potsdam, but it was free at the time. So, um, yeah. so, so they're just, we just didn't spend much money. So, I, you know, everyone had, what, someone had someone in their family who had gotten a hold of West marks. And so for whenever I left, my Oma always had some West marks and she would sew it into the pocket, the lining of my coat because you weren't allowed to have Westmarks or export them either. And so she, I remember on different occasions, she would sew 200 Westmarks into the lining of my coat or into the lining of my purse so that no one would find it when I, when I left, you know? Um, but my, you know, I don't know how much college your family has in their history. No, my family was not that curious. I can say that they, no one went to college. I don't remember anyone ever doing a, a physical activity, to be honest. So that was identified quite early in your life, but no one in my family ever skied. Um, they all became tradespeople. My uncle's job was as, as an artificial inseminator for cows for the local dairy. Um, no one really passed any of those courses to get them into college. I will say, you mentioned Cuba. So my cousin's husband was an iron worker and he had an opportunity to go work in Cuba for a few months. But because the, the bureaucracy did very heavy background work, they knew that he had family who lived in Alaska. And so they denied him his opportunity to work in Cuba because he might defect to Alaska and you know how close they are. So yeah, it was, it was very interesting that um, I also, one thing I need to add is that I was over there in August of, uh, late August of 1989, a few months before the wall fell. And at that time, Czechoslovakia had opened up their borders and a lot of people were emigrating to Czechoslovakia. And, I had a cousin who's my age. She's been in some of those photos. Um, she had been able to travel to West Berlin once or twice because she had very ill grandparents on her father's side. And she confided to me when I was there that August, she said, the next time I go because my grandfather's sick, I'm not coming back. I'm just going to stay. Um, and that opportunity did not present itself. But literally on the morning of the evening that the wall fell, she boarded a bus for Czechoslovakia and, and traveled and immigrated to Czechoslovakia. And three weeks later, she ended up in, in southern West Germany. But she just had enough. But she's the only one of my family who ever had that desire to do that. Yeah. You know? things I uh, I wanted to follow up with um, uh, first the money, and I wanted to say, as a kid, maybe maybe this was um, um, I was unaware, or it, it planted a seed of of us East Germans thinking of the West Germans as arrogant. But if a West German would come, and they would let's say four people have a hundred. West German marks that they translate into East German marks and they'd stay for 10 days. That's, that's a, you know, that's a grand. And they would just drop this money. They would just give it to people if it's, as if it's funny money. And it was funny money, but yeah, it nice. definitely left an impression on people in the East of these Westerners just having um, no appreciation or, you know, um, just handing, handing money out like fist over hand. And us maybe not being realizing, not maybe not realizing that, to, I mean, obviously they couldn't take it back. It was worthless. We knew that to them, but also why would they have so much? And of course they wouldn't necessarily always tell you um, that they had to do this on the border. Um, so yeah, there's, there's that. I've heard of these stories of West Germans have just so much money that they just like have them stack wise, you know, East German money um, when they come and, and visit it. So uh, I apologize if I ever was many, many years ago, 30 plus years ago, that I was in that position where I thought that the, the, the Germans or the Americans would come over just arrogant in that sense. And then the other thing is true. You as the one who, your mom didn't defect necessarily on, you know, on paper as like, let's say after the wall coming down and people would defect. My cousins, they were, uh, the, my father's cousins who then wanted to join my, my, my 
my great grandmother in the West, the one that did leave, uh, they did defect, meaning they left everything behind. Uh, first, they were thrown in jail, and then they were kind of like bought out by the West German government. So they were mm -hmm. a bargaining chips. And, and I, I, if people don't know this, uh, West Germany would frequently go in and say, give us the lists of the ones that wanted to leave, that wanted to defect. And there was an official way of doing this, but it would mean you lose everything. You cannot, like everything. Yeah. You, you probably will never know when it is, when the day is that you're going to be carted away and how long it will take you while you're in this limbo land of, you're, you're not really incarcerated, but you are. But you're 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 not committing any crime other than wanting to leave, but you were taken away from all you ever possessed, from all the friends that you ever had, just to cut and also to be mean and to you know malicious. But then the, the West Germans would go through that list and would say um, um, they would transfer money into East German accounts for so and so many people, so they would buy them out, and they would do this actually Europe wise. They would do this all in Romania with. Uh, uh, um, um, ethnic Germans who uh, uh, were claiming, so this, of course, predominantly was in East Germany. Um, anyway, people might not know that, um, but you were a liability for those who are staying behind. So because I had a great grandmother in the West, and there's, a, there's another story because of my grandfather and how my family always acted with the communist regime, we my future life of sorts would be like anything important that I ever wanted to achieve. I wanted to be a, a pilot. No go, right from the beginning. Um, I wanted to go to university. Um, possible, but probably not on something that will be very important to, to, to Germany. So no nuclear physicist for me in the future, right? Um, only because my family was marked. My great grandma, my great grandmother defected, defected, but she left East Germany. Then cousins defected. Actually, in 1954, my grandfather was um, arrested and put in jail um, for imperialistic propaganda. Um, he was in jail for eight years. Um, so uh, my, my uncle would always get drunk and sing the na German national anthem, the West German an national anthem, from the top of his lungs for the entire village to hear, <laughs> completely illegal, you know? And so the Stasi, the secret police knew they had our number. And, um, and, and so we, all of this is a liability against you in, in if you ever wanna become anything. The only way for me to possibly break the chain is to become one of these myself, to become one of those um, secret police, to join the party, the, the SA Day, the Communist Party. Um, so the only way for me to break out of this circle was to break with my family. And that would have never happened. So I was ready and when I was 15 years old, I knew that my world would look like what your cousins look like. I'll, I'll be working at the LPG, which is the Landwirtschaftliche Produktionsgenossenschaft, big word, of course, East German. It's the cooperative, the, the you know, farmer's cooperative. I might drive a tractor for the rest of my life. All these things I knew, I, I met, might be in the factory, but I knew I would never be a dentist, let's say, or something, something that's important to the communist part or better to the regime, you know? And I think we, we wanna be careful when we say communism and socialism so much because it was an abusive state. So if you are in power and in a dictatorship, no matter what you call that child, it's, it's evil. So when I pointed out Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, that's not what they were um, propagating in, in 1848 when the Communist Manifesto came out. They were writing from London about circumstances that people were living in at that time. And Das Kapital was trying to explain more social contract that was existence on that day. And it was taken hijacked by the, by the Communist Party later on Leninism followed um, after the uh, Soviet revolution uh, in 1918. So um, uh, no matter how you spin this, you know, we, we, we misuse the word socialism and communism all the time. And that comes from someone who lived up, grew up in it. And it's a touchy, it's, it's, it's tough. It's a tough conversation, you know, and uh, I'm, hope, I'm hoping we're getting some comments about that too. But uh, yeah, the regime 
sucked. But, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned it, living in it, and as a visitor, um, when you had fun, when you partied with your family, you kind of saw how important family was to East Germans. And I think when the wall came down, money became more important than your social construct and the family ties that you had. And my grandmother's, my own grandmother's uh, uh, family gatherings to her birthday went from, in East Germany, we were like 40, 50 people on her birthday and it dwindled down and we we're just, a, a, you know, a small amount of people left that, that kind of make the dates or, um, you know, have the time or um, are actually in town because many of my own cousins sort of left East Germany after the, the, the wall kind of came down and took jobs in West Germany and moved away. So um, anyway, the, the family um, was very important and, and, and the whole construct uh, kind of left with, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because um, a couple of things I just, I just think about. Yeah, I remember whenever it was anyone's birthday, regardless of the day of the week, everyone took the day off and there was a huge party and everyone came over and you set up the tables and the chairs and you had your cake and you had your beer and you had a tent and, and it didn't matter what day of the week it was. And I remember shortly after the fall of the wall, my, my mother telling me that my uncle was complaining that they had to wait until Saturday to have a party. They couldn't do it on a Wednesday or a Tuesday anymore. Um, but, you know, and so that's sort of the double-edged sword of, of that kind of a labor market is no one is afraid of losing their job in a sense, you know, I mean, and yet there was no incentive to work any harder. So, um, yeah, but, and that's, that's interesting because it's for my family, with the exception of that one cousin who actually ended up back in Berlin and still lives within a kilometer or two of where she went, grew up, everyone is in the exact same space. And, you know, I, I do a lot of studying on intercultural communication and intercultural learning and the dimension of individual individualism versus collectivism as a cultural dimension, Germany is second only to the United States as far as being very, very individualistic on the scale of, of every country in the world. But that did not take into account East Germany. And so I, was, I would argue that that's the opposite for East Germany. And to this day, and you'll see a couple of photos I have left here, all of my family still live literally on the same piece of property and no one has ever left. You know, uh, when you, you've talked about just being close to the wall, I know you've said your family lives very close to the wall. I had my other aunt and uncle, the uncle who was possibly part of the Stasi, they lived in what was called the Spargebiet. They lived within about one kilometer was their house of where the wall was. And so there was this very strange rule that no one over the age of 14 could visit their house. And so my mother never saw their house at all while she was growing up, well, after she left and came back. I, I could have visited their house prior to the edge of 14, but my mother thought that was odd and I never did. So frankly, between the time that my mother left Germany, left that area in 1952 and 1990, she never saw where her, her sister lives. They still live in that same area at Hohen Neuendorf, Neuendorf you know? Um, I'm gonna share the screen one more time, Christoph, if that's okay, okay with you. Sure, and I'll uh, make sure I'll talk about the Sperrgebiet one more time when we, we can come back. Yeah. So, so this is, okay, this is my family here, as you can see. So when I think of East Germany, I really just think of, of, of family. For me, it was always family. I was able to take my son back um, in 2016. And, and so I, and I get very excited when I see the Brandenburg tour every time because it has such meaning to my family. My mother remembers not being able to walk through there. Um, and we talk about the house. So this picture on the left is the house. Again, this house was bought for my grandfather by his father that's part of the Genossenschaft in, in Amalienfelde, and it is still our family home. This is that same house you can see here on the right, and this is my son laying on the trampoline. And on this property um, is both of my cousins have both built homes on the property. One of my cousin's sons is now building a home on the property. You know, as an American, the thought of living on the same property as my family kind of gives me a little bit of a heart attack. Um, yet I'm also really envious of the fact that they all are so close. And we just, my family here, and I knew no one on my father's side of the family. That's one reason this, this, makes, this means so much to me. And it means a lot to me, in fact, that this home is still in our family. My aunt who lived in this home until July, she actually died in July of lung cancer. I wasn't able to return, obviously because of COVID, but. I've made it really clear to my, my cousin, 
if for any reason we ever need to sell to let my brother or I know, my mother was left out of the will, but um, it means a lot to me to keep this in the family. Um, there's obviously still a lot of drinking that goes on even now. But I just wanted to say a couple of things. I'm going to stop the share while I finish this up. Is I think something that you know all em immigrants experience is you know you 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 immigrate to gain something that you know I I, I assume okay, I'm not an immigrant. I assume that you know that you leave something behind. And so for my mother, she's very well aware of everything that she gained becoming an American citizen while the rest of her family was in Germany and still is. But without you, oh, you always lose a little something with that. I think and so. Um, you know, in 1963, my mother applied for a visa to come visit. Her sister was very ill, and she was denied that visa because Stalin was coming to visit, actually. And so she was never able to go home when her sister became ill. She was never able to go home when her sister died. When my grandfather died in 1984, you could never, you could not make a phone call. You remember this, I'm sure. But it was, I asked my mother, when was the first time she was ever able to call home? Um, and she said, you know, it was after 1989. She could never, I, and I knew this, but I just wanted to hear it again from her, but she, you couldn't call. So when her father died, they sent a telegram, but the telegram never arrived for three weeks. And so she didn't know for three weeks that her father had passed away, actually. My mother was visited by the FBI. They questioned her when she was living in Alaska because she'd been to Germany a couple, too, one too many times, and they questioned her and her experience. Um, so it was just, you know, you leave, you definitely leave you. And she never had that same sense of family that, that the rest of her family does. My mother gratefully is still alive. I moved her to Utah three years ago to be closer to us, but my mother never experienced taking care of her own mother in that way. And when her own mother became ill, she didn't make it over before she died either. So, you know, um, those are just some of the things that, that I think about when we think about East Germany. And, you know, people always ask me like, you know, how has this impacted me as a traveler? And I do think that this experience of growing up, going over there has impacted me as a traveler. And number one, I developed a love of travel and being curious. And I think that curiosity is really what separates someone from being a passive tourist to being an engaged traveler. Um, and so I have this, there's always a sense of curiosity. I think that's what Go Learn does really well is that you, you educate and you engage as much as being, just being a tourist. It's more than that. And I really learned to shift my perspective. I was called a communist by my friends when I was growing up. Um, and I knew that, you know, like you say, that my family was not representative of the regime. So I feel like I learned how to shift my perspective and become self-aware of how I make meaning of the world. But I really tried to become aware of how others, particularly my family, make, makes meaning of the world. And I think that that's really the foundation of intercultural learning. I spoke in the beginning about how I work with students of recognizing intercultural competencies. And I, I look at intercultural competence as the ability to communicate and act appropriately and effectively across cultural differences. And when I say appropriately, I mean respectfully and effectively means achieving your goals. And so that's something I really try to think about when I travel. I want to give credit where credit's due. That's not my definition. That comes from Tara Harvey of True North Intercultural, who's a fantastic educator in intercultural learning. And I'll put that in the chat for people to look at later. But um, those are just some things I think about a lot when I think about what has that experienced. How has that experience traveling to the East shaped me as an adult and a traveler? And, and as a parent, frankly. You're muted, Christoph. Yeah, the computer just told me. You, you fool, you're mu muted. Do you unmute yourself? Um, uh, thanks. For, uh, I want to rewind just for a second because it goes back into the travel um, aspect of things. So I grew up right on the wall um, in Thuringen. Um, so I would, at night I would go up on the hill and I see Coburg uh, on the horizon, I see the light. And you have to know there's two, you know, necessity is one and the other. Um, um, basically we, we were always conserving energy. Um, <laughs> actually by, just by, by default because we didn't have it. So it was, our, our nights are very, very, very dark. Um, in the neck of the woods that I live in. And then right across uh, a mere 15 kilometers away from me is this shiny city uh, called Coburg. Um, and I've always wondered what it looks like. I see, this, I see the, shine, uh, the, the light. What I didn't know is they had this wonderful castle that they put um, you know, big uh, lights on. So it, it was even more illuminesque than, than I could have imagined. But um, once, I, once the wall came down, it was about three months after November 1989, so just in the, in the middle of winter of, of 1990, uh, very beginning of 1990, I, I went for the first time to Coburg uh, 
this was kind of like, at first it was kind of not safe to go. Obviously the, the wall in Berlin is very different than the wall where I was, but it was surrounded by about a five kilometer stretch and it's called the Spergebiet. And remember how we had them, what I showed you earlier, how I had like both walls on both sides. So there wasn't really much of a corridor for that part to go into. My best friend, Andy had a, had a grandma who lived in the Spergebiet and it was completely off, um, 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 off limits for us. We were not supposed to go in there. He had a, a permit because it was his grandma. So he had a permit technically, but he was supposed to be always with an adult. So one day we told all of our, I told my parents, I'm camping at his garden. Literally, that's what we did. That's what East Germans grew up with. You know, this is your vacation. You go to your friend's garden and put up a tent. It wasn't even a tent, it was just a tarp. Anyway, and, and he said, he's at my garden or he's at my place um, to stay overnight. Then we took the bikes and actually went into the Spergebiet, past the soldiers, which <laughs> Andy was just saying, hey, if they look at you, just look the other way and act normal. I, you know, we're dumb, right? And so we went to grandma, we had a great weekend at grandma's. We were picking strawberries, uh, which which they wouldn't grow, not that they wouldn't grow in, in our neck of the woods, but if, if, if you grow strawberries nearby where all the other East Germans are, these strawberries will be picked clear in the middle of the night, right? Um, so they had to grow them in the Spergebiet. <laughs> So, so we were sitting in the middle of the field, chowing down on, on strawberries, not knowing that there are landmines everywhere. And all here's the wall. I mean, I'm literally right at it. And we're just having a great time at grandma's. She would, she would make uh, Thuringian dumplings with pigeons uh, and this uh, king, thing called semisosa, which was like a, a, with the a, a leftover bread and, and eggs. Um, so anyway, it was delicious and great. And grandma and off and, and I'd go back. But years and years later, I told my mom about this and she just like almost lost it. <laughs> um, um, so, but uh, as getting out, getting, seeing something else, seeing something new, then the wall comes down. I go, I go to West Germany and I think ultimately um, that's the beauty about travel. You see something new, you, you press your comfort level, um, um, hopefully to the extreme sometimes. Uh, uh, I invite you to, to go to places like Romania. This is one of my... Uh, uh, top secrets right now. Um, Romania is just off the chart, beautiful. Uh, and push your comfort level a little bit, but even if you don't speak the language, but you come back so much more enriched. And that same thing sort of happened to me. But what you also learn, uh, just like Dorothy and Wizard of Oz, if you've never had a left, you wouldn't know how great it is at home. <laughs> so when I came back, I, I realized how scared I was to be in, East Germ in West Germany, thinking constantly, what if the wall goes up? What if the wall goes up? I'm in the West where I always wanted to be, but what if the wall goes up? Then I'm gonna be cut off from my family. And that was uh, in that first three months, that was, that's, that's what was in my mind when I was visiting the West. Had my, fest, my first uh, West German beer, which they gave me for free. That was awesome. And I could keep them up too. Um, it was just, you know, it was just a, for a 14 year old, it was, it was a great time, but also you knew I wanted to be back ho at home. And so, that's what I'm thinking right now, too. I can't go back home. Everybody is still in my village, and I'm hoping for this COVID thing to go by as quickly as possible so that I can pack my suitcase. And not that I want to leave here, but I, I really, I need to go home. I need to see my woods. My, I need to see my Thuringian forest. My, I need to visit my grandma's grave, um, which I haven't been able to. She passed away before this. So, yeah. Um, Anyway, um, that's, I, uh, what do you think? Should we wrap up and take some questions? Yeah, no, I, I, I think this is, I think that's really true. I want to, you know, it's, I just want to piggyback again one more time what you're saying is, um, you know, my mother, my mother is still alive and she has a sister, her younger sister is still alive. But I think when you leave, my mom will never travel again. She'll never go on another airplane again. And I think that that's always the hard part also when you leave, that you, you know, they always say you can't go home again. And there are, there are just those, certain sacrifices you make. You know, I want to kind of conclude with, with this, and I mentioned this to you once before, Christoph, is that why this, the subject is near and dear to me, not only because of the family, but just as something I think about a lot as I get older, is like when the, the fall of, of communism and the fall of the USSR, most of those countries, they, they, they regained their borders. And what East, for at least Germany lost its borders and I understand why that is, but when you think now, I think back on East Germany, 
it's very strange, like here's this country that had such specific borders and geographic demarcations and it's not there. And I think it's very disconcerting to go back and even stand in Berlin and to think about what was here. Did I really experience this? It's, it's just a very strange thought process that this country is no longer there. And so something I think about a lot is like, what is the cultural heritage of citizens of a country that no longer exists geographically? Because even though the country isn't there, the people and those experiences are still there. And it's just something I think about a lot. I think there's no right or wrong answer. There's I, there's some research out there on the internet. I've read about that, but it's it's interesting that there's just there's no more there there. Um, for for understandably why, but it makes for strange memories. I think sometimes. So yeah, let's go and take some. Chats I, I want to I wanted to say one one more thing about this. Obviously, you know, the East Germany you know, it's this uh, uh, post war 1945 uh, construct, which you know was actually created three years before the war, end of the war. What if we beat Hitler? The allies said, what are we gonna do with this country? And the, the occupied zones sort of like were created. Um, and then later it fell into the Soviet and American Cold War. And then the next thing you know, by 1948, we have the West German Republic call itself out. 1949, we have the East German De uh, Democratic Republic calling itself a country. And then each one of them actually um, recognized each other. Which was a which was kind of a, a problem for the reunification in the 90s, but that's a different topic. Uh, the point here is that first of all, it wasn't that long that the, this East German thing existed, but it was long enough for people who are now surviving, and even the next generation, even the generation down, that are being handed down these stories, that there is a cultural difference, and there is a, a pride, and there is a, a cultural um, a gap that needs to either be overcome or just over time will heal and and. Uh, and at this point, it's still quite a visible um, uh, 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 mark on the mm -hmm. German culture, and it's very much there, and it's, it's very obvious. Uh, I wanted to point out something that's in the, in the reverse that happened to me. Um, I always grew up with a dialect. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's actually a Franconian dialect, and I had no clue. I didn't, know, I didn't know how to label this. This was my village. My village talked like this, and this is it. The next village over had a slight different uh, accent, but still the same dialect and so on and so forth. But once we went over the mountain to the north, to West Germany, the rest of West Germany, nobody spoke our dialect. So I kind of like grew up in a little bit of a biling bilingual situation. Fast forward to 1989 and the wall coming down and I'm realizing everybody in Bavaria speaks exactly like my grandmother and my, gran my grandpa. So there is cultural, um, there were uh, cultural things such as language that the, that East Germany couldn't erase. And nobody in my age group, nobody knew that we are actually linguistically so much closer to Bavaria than, than anything else. So it, it goes by, it, it went vice versa too. Not, the, the 45 years, nothing could be erasing our cultural uh, heritage and so forth. And the next thing you know, we, we behave a lot more like Bavarians like with, than we do as the rest of Northern Germany. And, and that's because historically my neck of the wood kind of belonged to a kingdom that was uh, married into the Bavarian line, um, royal line. So that's a different yeah. story, but, it's, but as much as you can create different cultures within one country, it also is hard to leave you. Did you say Gruß Gott? No, we didn't. And, and, and yeah, and that's because, you know, of course, God was not to be mentioned in, uh, in, in East Germany. So yeah, yeah that's it. That's <laughs> we, would, we would always joke and we would say when, when somebody says, Grüß Gott, I would say, Mach ich, wenn ich ihn sehe. <laughs> I will do when I see him. <laughs> um, okay, let's do some questions. Um, should we do the chat first or the, or the Q&A? Uh, this is your show, Christoph, so <laughs> how do you do this best? Um, let me just read a few chat um, questions here. Uh, Richard made a comment. My office was at Checkpoint Charlie in 1961. Um, I, I would love to talk to Richard what that was like. I assume it was a regular office in terms of what, what, uh, where you worked. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'd like to know more about that. Yeah. Kathy, somewhere down uh, closer to, to just where we were, we were probably talking about this whole socialism, communism thing. I personally think Americans are trained to hate all kinds of, of socialism and communism, even when it means supporting obvious, obviously evil alternatives. Um, I like to say that I work at the U because it's the closest I'll ever get to socialism. 
between the healthcare and the retirement. That's, we have it good for sure. You too. Thank you, University of Utah. Yes. Um, okay, I, I covered this, but Mary was asking, Christoph, can you share about when and how and why you left? Um, that's a long, long story in many ways, but um, one thing happened after the wall came down that year in 1990, um, there was something like the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange Program. It's a sponsored program by both of our parliaments. Uh, nowadays, the Americans don't pay any money in it anymore, but the, Amer the Germans want to keep it alive. This is all out of the friendship to the Americans. And what it is, it's 600 students uh, from Germany, high school students can get to go to, to America and 600 high school students on the dime, everything's paid for by the government. Uh, by the way, look it up. If you have a high school age student uh, who is willing to go to Germany for a year um, and, and skip uh, your senior year, do it. It's the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange. I won the scholarship in 1991-92 as to be one of the first 100 uh, East Germans to leave on this scholarship. So I was incredibly lucky because one of my teachers said, Christoph, you're crazy enough to do this. Go apply. And I did. And my mom was like, yeah, sure, apply. You'll never get this deep down, she thought. And I did. So that's how it started. And the rest is just reading books and love America and always coming back. Um, a quick a quick one from uh, uh, Iravis. Is that a name? Iravis? Travis? Maybe it's Travis. Anyway. Yeah, Travis. Sorry, I got cut off. Uh, thank you so much for doing these. Um, as a U graduate, whoop, whoop, um, long time ago, it doesn't matter. And then having my children either graduate from the U um, um, are currently there or are currently there. I'm so glad you found these webinars uh, with some German background in our family and my daughter doing a church mission there. Uh, we have visited multiple times and love Germany almost as much as living here in beautiful Midway. Ooh, Midway! Um, have loved these. The, fa uh, the fairy tale one led me to buy the recommended book and that has been fascinating. Please keep them doing, keep doing them. Uh, I will jump on anything Germany. All right, great, Travis, thank you. And thanks for loving Germany. Um, one more, uh, there's, whoa, there's, there's a bunch here. I'm gonna go one more out of here because this was close to, to one o'clock and then we'll go over to some of the questions that came through the Q and A. Uh, have you seen line of separation um, on PBS question mark? It opens in East Germany in 1960. If so, is it true to uh, your exp experiences? Um, Rosemary, I have not seen this. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a total consumer of PBS, anything and all. And I will write this down because uh, I will definitely want to see this. Uh, shout out to our friends up, uh, formerly known as, K, K, um, as KUED, uh, PBS Utah, and our friends at KUER, our public radio station, um, um, which both are hosts at the University of Utah campus, if you don't know. So line of separation. Um, is that a fictional show or is it more of a documentary? Um, I wouldn't know. So there's, it wasn't yeah. in the comments, so I would I'm going to have to look that up, yeah. Could be a, yeah. Uh, I did write down that your mom got citizenship to the United States exactly the year that the wall went up. Holy cow. <laughs> you know, yeah, and I asked her actually recently, I said, how, when, how did you find out about the wall being erected? What did you, and she, she said, I think on the news, I asked her what she thought about it. She, it was so long ago, she didn't remember, but she, she found out about it on the, on the news, which I think would be really interesting. There's a neat, neat question here from Antonio about the architecture between the East and the West. And it's fine to see that you think it's different because, um, well, I think because we've, there's been so much reconstruction in East Berlin, um, but I doubt there's a ban to modernize it. I somehow doubt that, but um, it's interesting that for you, that you that you know the difference. I think it's just so much has been rebuilt in the past 20, 30 yeah. years. I'm gonna jump over to the Q and A and, and we were rattling down some of those. We, have, we seem to have nine of them. So let's go really quick. Um, yeah. David, David writes two, two parts. I wonder how many viewers took German at the U and how have, who have lived in German speaking country. Um, uh, that's right. I always I was wonder about our audience and where they come from, send us a note so we know and, and what you've done. Um, and then he follows up with, uh, to the previous question, has anyone in the audience lived on both sides of the wall? We wanna hear from you if you have. Uh, Marcella visited, I've lived on both sides. I also lived in Bonn, the former capital for a few years, um, working on I was actually running the program that I was part of, the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange. So um, Kent, Kent is writing. Uh, Marcella, 
was, you, know, you want to read this out? It's, uh, yeah, and actually, thanks for bringing this up, Ken. Yeah, um, because I do, ask, I forgot to touch on this. Read Ken, the question yeah. first. Okay, so was your mother able to stay in contact with her siblings after moving to the United States? Only by letter, that's it. That was the absolutely only way that she could do that. And we know that some of the letters were read. How did she become proficient in English? Um, immersion and practice. She learned a little bit of English, not in school, she learned Russian, but when she was working for the, um, for the American GIs, but she really practiced it when she, when she came here. She really didn't know it much before then. Was she able to return to East Germany when, was it when the wall came down? So one thing I forgot to touch on, you know, when, when she left is between the years of 1952 and 1964, she only was able to return to her family one time and that was right before she moved, she took the mods down to the United States in 1957, but she only saw them that one time, it, literally between 52 and 64, and then the next time back was when she came with me in 1968. So um, it was really minimal communication, and that was very hard. It was only by letters, no phones, or no telegrams that came through, and then that one, that one trip, you know? Yeah. Um, outside um, of Lynn, are there any long sections or sections of the wall still standing between the east and west? I don't know that answer. I can speak to that. Um, yeah. Of course, there are uh, little spots. Uh, in fact, just a, 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 a year or two ago, they found a, a surprisingly large stretch of a formerly unknown part of the Berlin Wall that was still up. <laughs> yes, in the middle of Berlin in some wooded area. Um, people were just thinking that's part of the building, so whatnot, but it actually turned out it was part of the earliest uh, uh, parts of the Berlin Wall. So they, they discovered a few things, um, but obviously the biggest and longest stretch is the East Side Gallery um, um, over on, I uh, uh, forgot what the road is called, but if you Google it, East Side Gallery is probably the only large stretch that is still remaining. There is a Mawa Park uh, that's part of a memorial um, up in the uh, northern part of uh, uh, Berlin. Um, and then obviously they have the um, East Side Gallery. Uh, <laughs> uh, it makes me chuckle because uh, just images flash in front of me. I've seen it many times driving by and everything, but recently um, a developer right behind it wanted to build luxury housings, and they did, I guess. And in order to create parking and access to it, they would have uh, had to um, demolish part of the East Side Gallery. And, uh, you know, here, uh, the, the German news brings it on and, and says here the demonstrations and even uh, 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 famous Americans are coming to support it. And I'm looking at the news and who sits on the wall protesting um, the, that the East Side Gallery will have a hole. Um, it's, uh, um, oh man, it escapes me right now. The Knight Rider guy. What's his? Uh, David Hasselhoff. David Hasselhoff. Big watch. The Germans love David Hasselhoff. And David Hasselhoff loves the Germans because of that. So he was sitting on the wall protesting with all these Berliners. Um, that's the East Side Gallery. Long winded answer, sorry. Donald, uh, my wife was raised in Hanover in Northwestern Germany during World War II. She and I have visited uh, Germany several times and I have a couple of interesting uh, personal impressions. First, my wife's remaining uh, family in Mannheim in West Germany have always resented the Easterners. I know. Uh, who became their countrymen after the reunification because they feel that the Easterners have received uh, preferential welfare and financial treatment by the government. Second, several of the Easterners that, have, that we have met have expressed a nostalgia for the good old days prior to the reunification, which seems to be related to the loss of sense of community. Well, we spoke a lot about that, but we, uh, we didn't address the West Germans and how they feel about us East Germans. And that is, that is true. Uh, in Bonn, <laughs> my nickname in Bonn was Quote. Uh, my, my friends in Berlin uh, called me the Quota because they said, you know, every West Germaner should have at least one East German friend. <laughs> so I was their quota that they had to refulfill in terms of having an East German friend. So um, I think a lot of East and Westerners, they get they get, a, get along fine. And it's true that even though it's small, we have a tax called the solidarity tax that we all pay. So every German pays that. And it's to be uh, used for uh, rebuilding the East. Um, it is true. So all kinds of things are true. But unfortunately, some of the things that West Germans may not realize is we didn't have a Marshall Plan. In fact, the Russians came over and dismantled all of our fact, most of our factories by the millions and millions, uh, and in fact, uh, distracted in the first 10 years after the war, 
immense amounts of resources uh, from East Germany, which then ultimately led to the fact that the East Germans had to build a Berlin Wall because their population was, was fleeing. There were over 3 million people out of the uh, back then 15 or so million that already left by 1961. So in, a, in, a, in an odd way, in order to save their own regime, the, West, the East Germans had to do this. Um, but yes, we didn't have a Marshall Plan, um, although it was offered to us. Uh, the Soviets were too proud and the East Germans. Uh, they created their own washer pact out of, out of an, an anti-movement to that. But yeah, they, we, we forget that West Germans had some help at some point too. So um, what did East Germany produce? Pickles. Stuff. <laughs> so there are a few luxury items that you might not be aware of. Some of it is especially lenses, optics. Um, um, I believe Gina, yeah. I believe the planetarium, even here in Salt Lake City, if you see the, the big thing that actually um, makes your lasers and creates the night stars for you, or for you is probably built in East Germany. So I need to check on that. But it's a call size. Uh, they were big into that. And it was a big export. Anything that was big export was very important to the East Germans. Another thing that was big export were guns, hunting guns. If you have a fanatic hunter in your family, ask them about the Suhl. If they ever wanted to have a rifle from SUHL, that's a town in my neck of the woods, very famous hunting rifles. Um, the best ones were always exported and America was a big, obviously, a big market for those. Um, uh, we, we produced stuff. I mean, we did, you know, I mean, we were limited. We couldn't grow dates or something, but, um, you know, you also had to be careful on what you grow. We talked about this earlier. If you had a strawberry field in the middle of the night, we would have all gone out and picked the strawberries. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we had a lot of potatoes. Yes. Well, and I think the, the Spreewald, the Spreewald was an area where they're exporting pickles, the best pickles in the world. And you can still find them downtown in Seafood's delis. But oh, absolutely. This, uh, but, world, world Market sells them. Uh, yeah, but they were not available in the East. They were only available in the West, the Spreewald Gürken. No. Well, they were a great e export for sure. If you've yeah. never been, the Spreewald is just a, a, a oh, it's fantastic area of, of woods situated all over water. There's endless rivers. It's very marshy. And the only way of transportation there is by boat. And they usually have these big, almost like the gondolas in Italy, in, in, in Venice, but a little flat and more for transportation. It's a great place to visit just outside of Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, family was very important in East Germany. Uh, know about the uncle, but did either family look at secret police records when opened? Good question. Learned of friends and or family betray friends or family question mark uh, or chose not to question mark. Um, so that's kind of part of the reason why I don't, I have not gone to the uh, um, ministry that I can look into my own file. Uh, I doubt that I had family members trying to hurt us within the family, but I, but I just know that in a, in a village like mine of about a thousand people, um, I know we were spied upon by all kinds of people all around us, and I just didn't want to, I don't want to find out. I, I never got hurt. Luckily, everything, everything turned out fine, and I am, I am okay. For those who've been seriously hurt, like my, my grandpa, if, 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 if he was alive, I would understand if he would like to know exactly what, what went down. Yeah. But, uh, but it, it's, it's an interesting topic. When, we, when I go back, we, we, we barely ever speak about it. Mm -hmm. I don't go to my next door neighbor and go like, hey, have you know, heard you've been in the Stasi. <laughs> Um, my uncle, I can tell you, the one who always sang the national anthem um, from the top of his lungs when he had one beer too many, um, he, he is of a different opinion. If, if he, he would like to know, he was, he was, he was hurt enough that, that um, it matters, you know, and, and, and of course he's got 30 years on me. So um, yes, it does matter to, to someone like him. Um, yeah. Yeah, when we the right... I mentioned earlier, there's a rumor that my uncle was one of the Stasi. I feel like as long as he's alive, I should not know that information. And, you know, we don't really talk about it either. But when I go back, I stay with my family. So I think it would be odd for me to say, hey, you know, I really want to go look at these records. Um, because it just, but it's something I think about, but I've not done yet. But maybe someday after, perhaps after my mother's no longer here, I might do it, you know. I'm trying to see if we can have, I mean, there. 
there's a lot of feedback in the in the in the chat. Uh, mostly, it's like, oh, thank you. It was so interesting, and all those. I don't want to. I I love it. Thank you for letting us know. I just want to see if there is something popping out. So we're going to scroll down the questions that, um, you know, that maybe uh, might be good for, you know, still we're talking about it, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, how did I learn English? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I didn't have any English background when I was that exchange student. And I guess being in high school and being an exchange student and being so good looking like I was, I really wanted to talk and be intelligent as well, aside from the looks. And so I guess I just started babbling and learning and whatnot. Um, it, it's a process to learn a, a foreign language. Number one best thing that ever happened to me is that I never had a real good this would be offensive to my English teacher because I did have some English background, but really it, it was non-existent, honestly, from coming from East Germany. I, I, I knew a lick, especially American English, you know, the British way of how our teachers spoke or tried to speak. Um, so it was non-existent. And then coming to a, a complete um, immersion in New Hampshire, that was really helpful. Nobody spoke English. And so for half a year, I was not able to really communicate. And then it just finally sort of made click and it and you know and over the years you you keep reading books in English you keep watching TV shows if you're not immersed anymore in the culture and for my part I came back a few times and I got an undergraduate degree in Vermont and so it, it it's a process you don't learn a language just at once um, so much about that do you see anything that still pops out there is a lot it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, thank you, Rosemary, for saying that the line of separation is fictional. I'm going to look at that. That sounds wonderful. Um, and Chris Anderson has written that he's collecting East German lenses and cameras. It is interesting that you mentioned Carl Zeiss because, as you saw in some of the photos of my mother, she's wearing these very thick Coke bottle glasses. My mother was born with a stretched optic nerve. She's been legally blind for the past 30 years. She's almost completely blind at this point in her life. But she will talk about when she goes to the eye doctor and they say, well, when did you have this happen to you? I've been with her at the eye doctor when she talks about Khrushchev visiting Germany. And that's how she remembered when she got her lenses from the Carl Zeiss factory. So it, even Carl Zeiss back then in Vienna had an impact on her with those lenses. And I think we might have a camera from there in her house. Thank um, you. I, I guess, first off, I want to say thank you to you because this has been really fun for me. I've never been able to talk about this quite this much because my friends don't want to listen to me speak this long. But um, thank you for this opportunity. It's well, been you gotta really fun to discuss this. Thank the audience more, you know. Um, yeah, thank you to all of you who are still with us. This is, um, and it's great to see all these positive things about Germany. I don't always see that. I mean, um, we, we, mm -hmm. I know that in the audience, I knew this would happen, but there's some incredible people, of course, that, you know, if we could, we would just say, hey, now you speak. Uh, you know, I, I, one person here was actually in East Germany as an engineer for Latter-day Saints when they built the, the temple um, in Freiburg. Wow. And so he had, he was there multiple times in the 80s um, um, when, when, the, when the temple was built uh, in, in East Germany. So needless to say, he had quite some uh, experience. This was in Saxony. Um, and in fact, his mother immigrated from there. So Everybody has a story and this is great. And I'm glad you shared yours. And especially, you know, um, mom, if you see this, uh, I know you will get, will get the recording. Um, it, it is so nice to vicariously meet you um, and, and, and hear your story. And um, I think this is great. I, I'm glad we, we recorded it. And Marcella, next time you talk to your mom, make sure you, you I always regretted not recording my folks you know, and I have all these stories from my grandma work, uh, living in World War II um, and through it. Um, and, and there's there's so much, so many stories and everybody has one, all of everybody you. Everybody does, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. so that's another story. <laughs> well, I, I hope there's nothing very important that we skipped. There were so many questions that, um, I mean, I have 20 new messages and I cannot, I wanna read them. So for you, for those who don't know, um, Zoom saves this and also a log of the questions. So I'm gonna read them, especially from this seminar or webinar. I'm gonna read them just in case we missed something and follow up with uh, whoever had that question possibly. And um, it's, it's just a little overwhelming. We have, we have so many comments right now that I'm, I'm, we need to wrap it up. <laughs>
<laughs> maybe we can put together a bibliography of some of the shows that we might recommend or movies or resources also that we can send out. Yeah, for those who are still in the audience, if you haven't seen so yet, The Lives of Others is number one I always recommend. You know, then there's Berlin 1984. I think it's a television show that's really great about an East German spy in West Germany. Um, that's, that's really good. I only started it a, a, a while ago and I have to re revisit it. COVID sort of like snuck up on me and I never watched television again, at least on, on this one. So yeah, thanks everyone out there. Marcella, thank you for um, thank you. sharing yours and especially your mom's story and visiting my country. And again, I would have asked you a thousand questions if I had met you back then. Well, and that is why you travel, Christoph, and my family are still afraid to get on an airplane. <laughs> it's curiosity. And that's, that's, that is not hyperbole. That is the truth. Okay. Well, all right. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone in the thank audience. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And uh, um, I'll catch you after COVID uh, in person, and we'll, we'll catch up even more. Okay, Marcella? Great. Thanks thank for doing you. This. Cheers. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.